Okay, um, welcome. This is uh, the Quantum Minor course, the first lecture. It's going to be a series of roughly 16 hours worth of lectures. Um, quantum Matter in the Age of Coronavirus. The lectures are part of the Masters of Mathematical Physics course at Oxford, roughly master's level, also um, uh, first year PhD level courses. Um, if you are a PhD student who needs credit for this course, please email me. Um, so before we get going, a couple of, of resources that I should point you to. First of all, the course website, Oxford Quantum Matter 2020.tiddlyspot.com, or you can just find the link to the course website from my webpage. There's a, a lot of resources on that on that webpage which you will find useful. Uh, these videos, for example, that's a uh, first useful thing. Presumably, the fact that you're watching this in case you have found the videos. Um, also, maybe I'll write that down. Videos. Um, there will be uh, course notes. The course notes, um, it's a, some 150 something page book um, which will follow the lectures extremely closely. Um, so you will find those um, pretty, pretty useful. There's also going to be um, everything I write down here, like, like this and, and this, anything I write down, they will be dumped to a PDF file, um, which you can, you can download too, so you don't have to take notes while you're watching these videos. You can just uh, download what I write if you like. Um, so there'll be PDFs um, sitting there. And uh, there are lots of other resources as, as well sitting on the, on the web page. Also on the web page, um, a number of organizational items for people taking the course for credit. Um, the homeworks that you're supposed to do if you're taking the course in the homework only mode. Information about the exam if you're taking the uh, course in the uh, exam only mode. There will be uh, information about the homework um, classes, uh, information about the teaching assistant, uh, office hours, we're going to have some sort of discussion time to replace the fact that we're having um, recorded lectures rather than live le lectures. And um, if there are remaining questions in addition, in, um, in addition to what uh, is answered on the, on the course webpage, please just um, email me or the, or the course TA. So organizational, organizational items also on the course web page. Um, I should also say, um, in regards to course prerequisites, um, there's an assumption, if you're watching these, these videos, that you understand quantum mechanics pretty well, that you understand Statnec pretty well. Um, there's, we're going to use some amount of a second quantized notation. We will review it, so you don't have to be, you know, really, um, really, up to full speed on it entirely, but it would be good if you've seen it before. People who've taken, for example, the advanced quantum theory course uh, way back in Michaelmas term will be fine. Um, if you've had other courses which use a lot of uh, second quantized notation, you'll, you'll be fine. If not, there's, um, there will be some links on the web page of where you can look to uh, learn a little bit about that if it's not uh, sufficiently clear to go along. Uh, before we go on, and actually start the lectures properly, um, I should uh, give a few apologies. The first apology is um, that these lectures are not being done live. They're being recorded. Um, and this was something that, that I thought long and hard about. Uh, initially, I thought I really wanted to do the lectures live over, over some sort of um, web system like Teams or Zoom or something like that. And there's a lot of advantage to being live so that you can interrupt and ask questions. Um, but the university uh, gave us a fairly strong uh, steer that they wanted lectures to be recorded. And they have a couple of reasons for this, some of the reasons which didn't seem like they were great reasons. But in the end, there was one reason that actually I, I decided was um, significant enough that I should, I should bend and I should pre-record all the lectures. And that reason is that um, with you know, the situation we're in right now in the age of coronavirus, there's probably a pretty significant chance that some of the lecturers are going to be incapacitated for some amount of time during the term. And it's 
whenever a lecturer gets sick during the year, it's always quite a bit of a scramble to find a replacement lecturer at the last minute. And considering the number of balls that are up in the air, you know, we're juggling so many things, trying to fix everything and, and make everything run, despite the fact that everyone's still in their, in their house, cancel, um, that everyone's uh, still sitting in their, in their house and we're still trying to teach courses. There's a, a lot that we're trying to, to do all at the same time and adding one more complication of having to replace lecturers at the last minute, knowing that there are going to be um, a, a lot of absences. It's just one additional problem we really need to avoid. So uh, the idea is that we're going to record these lectures in advance, have these things in the bank, and, um, and make them available uh, to you um, to, to watch during the term as if they were as if they were live. And I apologize that there's uh, not an opportunity to interrupt me during the lecture, but I'll give you opportunities to ask questions um, over Skype or, or Zoom um, during the term uh, instead. Um, so that's the, the big apology. Another apology is for those people who watched um, the, my previous lecture series, the Oxford Solid State Basics, the undergraduate solid state course that I taught a few years ago, I should warn you that um, those lectures were extremely polished in comparison to what you're going to see here. So this is really scrambled together at the last minute. The recording is being done you know, in my bedroom here, um, um, extremely, despite the, the necktie, um, it's, it's extremely unprofessionally done. Um, they're not rehearsed at the same level that the other lectures were, um, and it's going to be a, a little bit rougher. So uh, I apologize if you're expecting the same kind of quality that we saw in those lectures before. It's probably going to be a little bit uh, harder going. Um, there's another big apology that I should say, you know, along with the uh, general statement about um, the lectures being a, a little bit lower in, in general quality and professionalism. So I have a, a three-month-old baby in, in the other room right behind me here, and um, inevitably she is going to yell and scream and cry in the middle of the, the lectures, and that's going to be very distracting, uh, if not for you, certainly for me. And I'll probably have to stop the, the lecture camera in the middle and, you know, paste things together and, and fix things and so forth, and it's going to make things seem a little bit jumpy here and there. So uh, I apologize for that in advance. Um, it's, it's actually a, a little bit in, in incredible that she, um, she can already tell when I'm talking to her in a way that's, that's, uh, uh, that's nice versus lecturing physics. She likes it when I tell her stories, but she doesn't like it when I'm, I'm lecturing quantum physics. Um, and and you know, it's, it's, it's incredible. You know, at three months old, she can already distinguish these things in, in, a, in a fairly uh, mature way. Um, so she gets, she tends to get rather irate when she hears me um, lecturing physics. She doesn't doesn't like that at all, and it's it's maybe not so uh, unexpected. For example, you know, I um, uh, she cried quite a bit when um, when I gave her Lando a lift shit. She she really didn't like that at all. Okay, my final apology is that um, my jokes are really going to fall incredibly flat without an audience. Um, I didn't. I decided I'm not going to put a laugh track on these on these videos. So you know, if you don't find them funny, you're going to be stuck with them. I, I laugh at my own jokes. I tell them really for my own entertainment. So so you're going to have to have to listen to them, even if you find them incredibly unfunny. So apologize uh, about that. Okay. Um, so let's get started. Um, so I'm going to sit down here a little bit. So if I need to write more things. Um, so we'll start with the question, uh, what is it we're studying this term? Uh, what we are studying is quantum matter, in the title of the course, but what we mean by this is quantum states of, states of matter. Um, let's do that, um, do, do, like this, quantum states of matter, um, and what we mean by that is states of matter, where quantum mechanics is is extremely important. important. Um, much of the term, we are going to be studying um, uh, superfluids and superconductors, superfluids and superconductors, uh, and these are two really extreme cases where quantum mechanics gives the type of matter uh, extremely unusual properties. Um, now, 
for all quantum states of matter, the quantumness of the state of matter is usually more profound and more obvious if you're looking at low temperature compared to some uh, given uh, energy scale. Superfluids and superconductors are cases where the energy scale is low compared to room temperature as well. Um, but in other cases, at least some that we'll see, uh, low temperature might be might, might even be room temperature, but it will be low compared to some other energy scale like, like Fermi energy. So we'll start the term studying um, Bose superfluids, Bose superfluids, and um, the um, there's there's two main cases that we'll we'll study right off the bat, and one of them that you presumably know already from your undergraduate stat mech courses, and that's a Bose-Einstein condensate B, BECs. Um, now the the strict definition of a of a, of a Bose-Einstein condensate is a system of, of non-interacting bosons, and below a certain temperature, all of the bosons, or a macroscopic fraction of the bosons, go into a single uh, quantum eigenstate, and we call this Bose condensation. If, uh, assume you know a little bit about this. If you don't, it's probably something you might want to read a, a little bit about, because we're going to use some of that information. In the modern era, there are experiments that um, the probe Bose-Einstein condensation with uh, cold trapped atoms. And in these cases, the, the bosons are not completely non-interacting, but they're weakly interacting. And, it, and we still, even though it's, you know, it's not strictly speaking the Bose-Einstein condensate the way it was orig originally envisaged, you know, really non-interacting bosons, but it's weakly interacting bosons. And um, so we still call it Bose-Einstein condensation, even though it's not uh, completely non-interacting. Um, now, there's a second example, which we are going to spend an awful lot of time um, studying, which is the example of superfluid um, helium-4, helium-4, that's regular helium, helium with the 4 is, is the number of nucleons, 2 um, protons and 2, and two, two neutrons, and the superfluid helium-4, helium-4 is that atom, the helium-4 atom is a boson, and it, below a certain temperature, it, it goes through a phase transition and becomes a superfluid. We'll define exactly what that is um, in, in a little bit. Um, but it's, it's very different from uh, the Bose-Einstein condensates in that um, this, the helium atoms are very strongly interacting with each other, particularly strongly interacting at very short distances. If you take two of these atoms and you try to stick them right on top of each other, they repel each other extremely strongly. At longer distances, they're very weakly interacting with helium. Helium is not a strongly interacting uh, atom. At long distances, it just has Van der Waals interactions. But uh, it doesn't form you know, covalent bond, bonds or ionic bonds. But it, at short distances, it, they're like, um, you know, like billiard balls at, at short enough distances. OK, now within our study of um, Bose superfluids, we're going to move on to study superconductors. Um, superconductors, conduct, okay, we spelled that already, conductors, um, there, I spelled better, and we're going to first, in, in at least in our, our first iteration, we're going to um, view the superconductors as a, um, uh, like a condensate or a superfluid of, of charged bosons, so this is is a, may I'll say it's approximately equal to, approximately equal to, superfluid of charged bosons. Superfluid. I'm gonna have to get used to of charged bosons. Um, and that's a little bit. Um, you know, this picture of uh, superfluid of charged bosons is actually going to get us pretty far in the understanding of, of the properties of, of superconductors. Now, this is a little bit surprising that we can, we can reach this, this understanding of uh, superconductors as superfluid charged bosons, because superconductors are typically their metals. They're things like aluminum or, or lead or mercury. And the objects that are carrying charges are not 
bosons, they're, they're fermions, they're electrons. Um, so why is it we're thinking about this material as being a superfluid charged bosons? Well, the uh, cartoon picture that we'll use is that the electrons can pair up to form uh, a charge, um, maybe a charge 2E boson. Um, so you can pair up the electrons to have charge 2E, twice the charge of a single electron in a, in a, in a pair. You put two of them together and you, you have uh, um, two electrons in one pair. And um, those, that pair of, of, of electrons then acts as a boson. Well, why should a pair of electrons act um, as, as, a, as, as a boson? Well, remember that fermions have the property that if you exchange them, you pick up a minus sign. If you put two fermions together in the same place and you exchange them with two fermions in another place, that gives you an even, you know, exchange of pairs, you get an even number of minus signs, and so that's a plus sign, so exchanging the pairs you just go, you realize that the pairs must must be must be bosons. Now this picture uh, of paired bosons, uh, of paired electrons forming a boson, is is really not not accurate. Um, there's um, maybe we should put the bosons in, in in quotes because the electrons. The truth is that they don't stick together to form uh, to form bosons. Not not very strongly at any rate. And there was uh, certainly there was a lot of pushback against this picture of um, superconductors being um, you know, uh, superfluid of charged, uh, charged 2E bosons uh, initially, despite the fact that it, it does predict some of the phenomenology correctly. There's just no attractive force that would force the electrons to come um, to pair together uh, in that way. And, for, and if there were an attractive force, if you can come up with any, it would certainly be too weak to hold the electrons tight enough together so that you could treat them as a single particle, a boson. I mean, there's, there's examples where you do have fermions pairing together to form bosons. For example, superfluid helium-4. Helium-4, the individual particles are protons and neutrons and electrons, and these are all fermions, but the superfluid helium atom is bound together extremely strongly at a very, very high energy scale to form a single boson, which is that one billiard ball uh, helium atom. But there's no such, and, and the forces here are, you know, on the holding, the energy scales holding together the helium atom are, well, the nuclear energy scale, which is absolutely ginormous, and then the, um, the Rydberg scale holding the electrons to the nucleus, also uh, huge um, compared to the temperature scales where we're interested in studying uh, the superfluid. So there are cases where you can really make a strong paired boson out of individual fermions, but electrons in a metal, like aluminum or lead, don't pair together uh, that strongly. So to understand why it is that we can treat uh, electron pairing as, as bosons, we have to take a detour. And the detour is an interesting detour, which is to switch to a different uh, quantum state of matter, which is the quantum state of matter, which is Fermi liquid. So you may have heard about Fermi liquids before. Um, well, by Fermi liquids, what we in this case mean is things like um, things like metals, um, where lots of fermions running around. And um, the there'll be so when we talk about Fermi liquids, we'll talk mainly about electrons and metal, but there's so electrons in metals. Um, but there is an exception. We'll also talk about helium-3 fluid. Um, so helium-3, remember, is an, is an isotope of helium where there are only three nucleons rather than four nucleons. So it has uh, two protons and one neutron instead of two protons and, and, um, and, and, and two neutrons. And helium-3 is a fermion. And if you have um, a, a fluid of helium-3, it is also a, a Fermi liquid that has a Fermi surface and um, you know has a Fermi energy and um, and that sort of thing. Anyway, so we need to understand uh, the physics of, of of Fermi liquids uh, in order to understand why it is that electrons pair together, or why we can think of it as electrons pairing together to form bosons and then forming uh, superconductors. Now um, the uh, 
the thing that makes makes um, you know we've already studied Fermi liquids in our undergraduate solid state courses. Um, we've probably studied you know free electron gas, and, and we know we understand things like Fermi energy and, and um, uh, you know Drude model and all these properties of of, of fermionic systems. We've we've um, presumably studied, and it's not that not that complicated. But what actually makes um, the theory of Fermi liquid interesting is that in real metallic systems, like electrons in aluminum, for example, or electrons in lead or mercury or whatever, um, the electrons are extremely strongly interacting. The energy scale of interaction between electrons in, uh, in a metal is typically as strong, you know, a high enough energy scale to be on the scale of the Fermi energy. And the Fermi energy, remember, is, is a huge number, 10,000 Kelvin or 40,000 Kelvin. It's an enormous number compared to room temperature. And this, so you think, well, this is an absolutely enormous energy scale, but the interaction between electrons that are very close together is also an enormous energy scale. And when we studied um, Fermi liquids in our you know, undergraduate solid, solid state courses, we just completely flew that out. We, you know, said, let's just ignore the interaction between electrons and, and how on earth did this make any sense? Um, well, it does make sense, and we're going to try to understand why that is. Once we've understood some things about, about Fermi liquids, we can come back to the, um, uh, sort of the third part of the course, which is um, BCS theory of superconductors, theory of supercond. Um, which um, will include, one, why is it the electrons attract each other? Why is it you can think of the electrons as, as form, forming pairs? Now, this third section of the course is not on the exam, not examinable. Nothing in BCS theory is examinable. I will still give the lectures, uh, as promised to you, so I will, I will do it. Uh, typically, we also have time for um, a special topic, special topic, and I believe the special topic I will cover, assuming I have time, energy, and I don't uh, get struck by coronavirus, will be a little bit of Majorana physics, Majorana physics, which, which follows, um, sort of maybe the how electron Majorana physics, which follows rather naturally from a BCS theory of superconductivity, and also, if you took my topological course last um, last fall, it actually is, is closely related to some of the things we talked about in, in that course as well. Um, okay, so good. Uh, let's uh, start the first section of the course. So the first section of the course, as we wrote up here, way up here, is we're going to talk about um, Bose superfluids um, and superconductors. So um, the states of matter we're going to be studying, superfluids, superconductors, um, as a matter of fact, all the states of matter we're going to talk about in the whole term, except for Fermi liquids, share the interesting property. So I'll maybe write this down. Um, Bose superfluids uh, and superconductors share an important property. Um, which is zero dissipation. Okay, what do I mean by zero dissipation? Well, let's take the example of, of superfluid helium-4. So, example. Um, let's imagine that we have a, um, a big tube, a torus, a big tube, so we draw a torus. The only thing I learned in my string theory classes is how to draw a torus. Um, not entirely true, but not so far from the truth either. Okay, so we have we have a torus. Think of it as a hollow pipe. We're going to fill the pipe with uh, helium four inside there, and we're going to start the helium four flowing around the pipe in a um, in a circle. Okay. Um, now, if we take that the helium four below the transition temperature, um, where it becomes superfluid. Um, once it's flowing around in a circle, it will continue to flow around in a circle, um, essentially forever. I mean, th there's, there's a couple caveats. The caveat is 
the temperature has to stay low enough, it has to stay below the transition temperature, the velocity of the fluid has to be small enough, and the sample has to be big enough. But with those um, restrictions, the, the fluid flow will continue flowing forever. And if you compare this to, if you did the same experiment with, with water, for example, you know, the, the fluid would start flowing around initially, but um, after a while, it would start to slow as it lost its energy to turbulence, to heat, to transferring energy into the walls of the system, and eventually the, the water would, would come to, to a rest. But in superfluid healing, it never comes to rest. You just keep going around and around and around for, forever and ever. Um, you can do exactly the same experiment with um, a solid torus of a superconductor. So let's uh, draw the same picture again. So um, here we take a, a chunk of, okay, here's a, this now, this is not, this is a solid, solid, and let's take a, a superconductor like aluminum, aluminum, um, aluminium, if you're British, which, well, okay, I'm, I'm now a, a, a citizen of, of, of Britain, I'm a subject of the Queen, but I haven't, I still don't say aluminium. Um, sorry about that. Um, but, um, okay, anyway, so we have a solid, <laughs> sorry about that little detour. Um, so we have a solid, um, big, thick um, wire. So there's a big, thick wire going around in, in a circle. Um, solid, no hole in the middle. Um, this torus has a hole in that middle, but not, it's, not, it's not a pipe. It's a big, solid uh, wire. Um, and we start current flowing around. So now it's uh, electron charges flowing around in, uh, in a circle. And if you cool it to a low temperature, below the superconducting transition temperature, and the um, current starts flowing. And once the current is flowing, uh, again with the same caveats, the temperature has to stay low enough, the sample has to be big enough, and the current has to be small enough, the current will flow essentially forever. It will just never stop. It will keep going round and round and round in, in the circles for absolutely forever. How long is forever? Well, there have been experiments that measure that the decay time in a superconductor is easily greater than um, 100,000 years. And it just becomes, beyond the 100,000 year decay time, it just becomes too difficult to put a number on what the decay time is. It's assumed that if they could measure more precisely, it would, not, it would be you know, a million years, 10 million years, 100 million years, a billion years, but it just becomes impossible to measure anything that precisely, and they've just bounded it at least 100,000 uh, years. Um, so essentially forever. Anyway, so this... Um, brings us to um, a, a little story um, from 1932 with a, a fellow by the name of Garrett Flem. Uh, I love the name too, so I'm going to write it down. You probably, you'll never hear of this guy again. He, I mean, he was a technician in the uh, cryogenic lab in, in Leiden, which was you know, the leading cryogenic lab uh, in the world up through the 1920s, certainly. Um, and he was a technician in, the, in this lab, and he wanted to do um, a, um, so he wanted to do a demonstration of this effect of zero dis dissipation, of persistent currents, the fact that you can start a current flowing and it will persist essentially forever. I mean, if, if you did the same experiment here with the current flowing around in a loop of wire, if you do that with a typical um, wire, say, at room temperature, aluminum at room temperature above the superconducting transition or a non-superconducting piece of copper or silver or gold or anything like that, you know, the, the, you start the current flowing around, and it will decay down to zero in a very, very short amount of time. Whereas in this experiment, the current will, you know, when you're below the, the um, as long as the temperature is below the critical temperature, and again up here, temperature below, below the critical temperature, as long as you're below the critical temperature, and the other caveats I mentioned, uh, then the current will flow forever. Anyway, Gary Flynn wanted to do a demonstration of this, of this interesting effect, and he wanted to impress the people in the Royal Society in London. And he decided the way he was going to do this was he was going to um, start the current flowing in Leiden, and he would transport the whole experiment from Leiden all the way to London and demonstrate that the current was still flowing. So he gets this, uh, he makes this sort of portable cryogenic apparatus, and he starts 200 amps of, of current flowing around. In, in a circle. Now, 200 amps of current is a lot of current. That will, that will, you know, in, at most times of the day, 200 amps of current will, you know, 
is enough current to power my entire house. Um, so, you know, okay, so you need you know, voltage and so forth, but, but you know, it's a lot of current flowing around it at any rate. It's, you know, it gives you a great big magnetic field from this current, and, um, and you know, so it's, you don't mess around with, it, with this amount of, amount of current. He, puts, he gets this current flowing and cools below the, um, uh, the, uh, the transition temperature, and he takes this cryostat, and he loads it onto his, his airplane. He was a, um, you know, an amateur pilot. And he takes off from, from Skipwell Airport, and he flies to Heathrow. And he goes through customs with this device, and they somehow they let him through customs. They, you know, they somehow he convinced them it wasn't a bomb or, or whatever it was. And he goes to uh, the Royal Society, and he shows them that the current, 200 amps, is still flowing around in a circle in this experiment many, many hours later. Um, even though he, you know, he started the current flowing in Leiden, they were pretty impressed. Um, this was perhaps one of the stupidest experiments ever done. Uh, I mean, it was very impressive, but it was exceedingly dangerous. I mean, when they say that you know Heathrow, it wasn't a bomb. This thing was a bomb. And why? Because if here's the problem: there's this uh, an experimentalist know this very well. Um, if you have a lot of current flowing around in a loop below the critical temperature in a superconductor, if any part of that superconductor raises its temperature to just above the critical temperature, then it becomes resistive. You know, it's not zero resistance anymore. It becomes finite resistance, and you have a lot of current flowing around. And you have a lot of current going through finite resistance that dissipates heat, and it makes it get hot, and that makes more of the sample go above the critical temperature, and then more of the sample goes above the above the critical temperature, and it's sort of an explosive reaction that all of a sudden you get a little bit of heat and then the whole thing you know, get, goes above the critical temperature. Then you have 200 amps flowing around a resistive wire. The whole thing melts. All of the, the, you know, the cryogen in your, in your experiment sort of boils off very suddenly. It's basically explosively. Um, and the whole experiment it explodes. And in the, um, you know, because you're dissipating an enormous amount of heat in a very, very short time, and you typically you cool these experiments with with uh, liquid helium. The liquid helium uh, boils very quickly and expands very quickly, and everything explodes. So you know this is a, an effect known very well to experimentalists. And modern cryogenic equipment have um, have a lot of safety valves in place to guard against this kind of thing happening because it's extremely dangerous when it does happen. Anyway, if if this had happened to Garrett Flynn while he was uh, over the English Channel in his private airplane, we never would have heard of Garrett Flynn again because he would have been dead. Um, and you know, going through customs, they should have stopped him because this thing, I mean, it didn't look like a bomb. He said it was an experiment, but actually it was a bomb. Um, so anyway, be careful if you're an experimentalist. These things uh, are not you know, for the, um, to be messed around with. OK, so as long as we're on the subject of, of history, we might as well start at the beginning uh, of the story. So the, the beginning of the story of, of really cryogenic experiments go back to Heike Kammerling-Onis. Kammerling, uh, did I spell that right? Yep, Onis. Uh, there's a double barrel last name. His first name was Heike, um, uh, who was in Leiden. And in 1908, um, he liquefies helium, liquid helium. Um, and what this is, liquid helium. And once you liquefy helium, that enabled him uh, access to very, very low temperatures and enabled to do experiments at very low temperatures. So this was a huge success in figuring out how to, how to liquefy helium. Um, almost exactly 109 years ago, on April 8th, uh, April 8th, uh, 1911, um, Okay, well, probably by the time you're, you're watching this video, it'll be after April 8th, but today it's a few days before April 8th. So happy birthday. Um, so on this day, he discovers, I'll put this in quotes, discovers, because he wasn't exactly sure what it was he discovered at the time, but he discovers uh, both superconductivity and conductivity and superfluidity. Okay, so what is it that he, he actually discovered? 
So he had put into his, his cryostat um, uh, some helium, sorry, some, some um, mercury, and he was measuring its resistance. And he noticed uh, below um, about 4.2 Kelvin, um, the resistance of, of mercury suddenly dropped to become immeasurably small. Now, at first, he probably thought, okay, maybe make some mistakes in the, in the experiment here. Um, but he checked it and rechecked it and rechecked it, and eventually he convinced himself that, that it was true, that below about 4.2 Kelvin, um, mercury loses uh, all resistance. Um, he, you know, he had reason for, for actually doing this, this experiment. There was lots of conjectures about what should happen to the to the conductivity of a metal at, at low temperature, and um, you know he wanted to find out what what happened, and, and what happened actually surprised him quite a bit. It wasn't you know, no one had predicted that this would happen. Um, now um, there's no real explanation for um, what causes superconductivity until um, about 1957 the, with the BCS theory of superconductivity, which we'll uh, discuss uh, later on, on in the at near the end of the term. Um, however, in, at, on the very same day, in his lab notebook, he uh, um, noticed that something else, or sorry, below 4.2 Kelvin, uh, resistance of mercury equals zero. Okay? This is what he resists. Mercury is at HG, right? HG goes to zero. Um, but he also noticed that um, around 2 Kelvin, he wrote in his notebook, something happens. Something happens. And he didn't, um, he didn't follow up on it for quite a, quite a while. What he was seeing was that something was going on with the helium gas that he was using to cool the, the, the mercury. And he didn't follow up on this for, for quite some time because he was so interested in this uh, um, superconductivity, this, this effect that the resistance of, of, of mercury uh, goes to zero. So, so this wasn't, wasn't follow, followed up on. He eventually convinced himself that, that indeed the resistance of mercury really was zero below, um, uh, below 4.2 Kelvin and um, won a Nobel Prize in, in 1913, I think, for, um, for the discovery of, of superconductivity. And then he, he researched superconductivity for quite a few years, um, discovering, for example, that other materials, not just mercury, have uh, become superconductors at, at low temperature, like lead and aluminum also become superconductors at low temperature, although their critical temperature is different. It's not always 4.2 Kelvin. It could be you know, 2.6 Kelvin or you know, 8.3 Kelvin. But at some low temperature, many, many materials become, become superconducting. Now, um, sort of about a decade later, um, Cameron Leonis and a couple of the other people from his lab went back to reconsider what was going on at, in this you know, something happens that they saw at, at, at 2 Kelvin and realized that something was, was happening in the um, in the, in the helium fluid, and they um, uh, identified it as a, as a phase transition. And the way they identified it as a phase transition was by looking at the, at the heat capacity. So let me draw this here. Um, so these are axes, these axes. And on this axis, we're going to draw the uh, specific heat, constant volume. And this axis will draw the temperature. And then, I guess it's, it was at 2.17, mo measured more carefully, Kelvin, um, at atmospheric pressure, um, he found a, uh, the, okay, the heat capacity, does something like this, it diverges from both sides, um, so it's, as we get to 2.17 Kelvin. This side of 2.17 Kelvin is the superfluid side, and And then the higher temperature is normal. Okay, it's, it's not quite as bent as this. Like this. Okay, and 
this um, transition uh, became known as the lambda transition, uh, diverging from both sides but with different coefficients. Um, and the reason it's called lambda transition is because this this picture is supposed to look like it's supposed to look like a lambda, kind of like that, you know, like, well, like a lambda, like this, something like that. Okay. Anyway. Um, If you're familiar with uh, critical exponents and, and phase transitions, uh, it turns out that this is um, from the um, XY universality class. Oops, let me move this so you can see it. Yeah, yeah the heat capacity diverges as T minus TC to the minus alpha, and, um, and the universality class is, is the 3D. XY universality class, but they, they didn't know about universality classes at the time. They didn't were you know they saw it was diverging from both sides, and the fact that it was diverging from both sides was an, is an indication that it's um, that it's a phase transition. So they, they knew that much. Um, Over the next few years, the the, the Leiden lab, Cameron Onis's lab, uh, explored more of the phases and phase transitions of, of helium. Actually. Um, Kemmerling Onis passed away in the 1920s, I think 1926, but the lab continued the work without him. And let me draw um, what the phase diagram of, of helium looks like in, in a little bit more detail. So this is uh, uh, helium-4, helium-4 phase diagram. Uh, so here we have a log pressure on this axis. We have log, oh, not log, uh, just the regular temperature on this axis. And we'll start with this phase transition line. Um, so this ends in a critical point, critical point here, and this is gas, and this is liquid. Um, so this is just like, like you know, water and steam, water vapor. You can go uh, around the critical point, or you can go uh, through the phase transition line. Um, then, if you go to very high pressure up here. Um, you have a solid. I pressurize it enough, it will turn into a solid. And this uh, occurs uh, at low temperature. This is about 20 atmospheres of pressure there. And then there's another line here, coming down like this. Um, and this is known as the lambda line. Um, that is you know, named for this transition that's supposed to look like a, a lambda. Um, and below the lambda line, the temperature is below the lambda line, you have super, uh, super fluid phase down here. Um, and there's a, uh, a little bit of, of nomenclature here. The normal liquid, not the uh, super fluid liquid, is sometimes known as helium-1, one, one in Roman numerals, and the super fluid liquid is sometimes known as helium-2, two, two in Roman numerals here. Um, this is terrible nomenclature because um, we also have helium-3 and helium-4, which means something totally different. So helium-4 means four nucleons. We have helium-3, which means three nucleons. We're not, not going to talk about helium-3 until much later in the term. Everything I'm going to say today or the next lecture is all helium-4, regular boson uh, helium. So we're, I'm just going to erase that helium-3. But this, this nomenclature issue is... Um, some annoyance that we have to worry about. It was just a historical accident that they happened to call this phase the helium-1 phase and this phase the helium-2 phase. They had no way of knowing that later on someone was going to discover a helium isotope with, um, with three nucleons that they'd then be forced to call helium-3 and, and it's compared to helium-4. So, okay, the, the nomenclature isn't great, but that's, that's what we're stuck with. Um, okay, let's put some, some numbers on this, on this plot. Um, at atmospheric pressure, that's, let's say right here, atmospheric pressure, one atmosphere, um, the helium goes from being a gas to a liquid at 4.2 Kelvin. And then um, if you have liquefied your helium at, um, at uh, uh, atmospheric pressure, the way you typically cool it down, or the easiest way to cool the fluid down further is to reduce the pressure, to pump on it, reduce the pressure. And then um, what you do is you sort of walk down this phase transition line 
this way um, until you hit the uh, triple point here, which is uh, known as the lambda point there. So that's the lambda point. And that's at 2.17 Kelvin, as uh, Cameron Lewis, um noted before. And this is at 0.05 atmosphere, like this. So this is what the phase transition, uh, the, what the phase diagram of, um, of helium looks like at, at low temperature. Now, um, a couple of, of comments before we start discussing the properties of the superfluid phase uh, of helium is, is why, why is helium special? Um, there are no other elements that do this. You, you, know, you don't get superfluid oxygen or superfluid carbon or anything like that. And there's two reasons why helium is special, why he is special, he always thinks he's special. Uh, why is helium special? Why is helium-4 special? There's two reasons. One is it has weak interactions. Um, it doesn't form uh, covalent bonds, doesn't form ionic bonds. Now, a, a few moments ago, I, I told you that, in fact, the interaction between two helium atoms is, is quite strong in the sense that if you try to, you know, it's like billiard balls. If you try to smash them into each other, they interact quite strongly. But if they're further apart, they interact only weakly via van der Waals forces. So it, it tends to be more like, you know, some, uh, some billiard balls smashing into each other and bouncing off of each other. And if they're at fairly low density, when they're sort of wandering around in, in free space, they don't attract each other to form, uh, form bonds or it's only very, very weak interaction. So that's one reason. But a more important reason is the mass is very small. The mass of a helium atom is very small, um, second smallest mass of an atom. Um, and that has important ramifications. And the reason that's important is because of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Delta P delta X is greater than H bar over two. Um, and so if you think about this for a second, suppose you were trying to form a, um, suppose you were trying to form a, a crystal out of, out of the helium atoms. Well, to do that, you would have to make, if you make, if, you make delta x small if you try to localize the position of of um, of your atoms. You're making delta x small. You're trying to constrain your helium atoms to sit in one particular uh, point, and that means uh, delta p gets large. And if uh, if delta p is large, write this better, large, um, that means the kinetic energy. Um, which is p squared over 2m is very big because, um, and it's very big because the mass is small, um, small. And so it's very, very expensive to try to uh, constrain the position of your, of your helium atoms into, into a lattice. So the, the helium doesn't form a lattice and instead it forms a superfluid where the, where the helium atoms can sort of move around much more and their, and their position isn't isn't constrained, so their delta x can be large, so their delta p can be can be small. Okay, now let's say a couple of words about about the properties of of helium uh, of superfluid helium. So about about superfluids superfluids um, fluids. Um, the most remarkable thing about superfluids is uh, is the persistent flow which I mentioned before, persistent flow, ent or ent. I don't know, maybe I spelled that wrong. Um, and you know, if you start the, the fluid flowing around in a, a toroidal tube, it will go on uh, forever and ever. But there's lots of other interesting properties which are unusual. It has extremely good, very good um, transport of heat, uh, port of heat. Um, and you know the when you go through the superfluid transition, the you know the thermal conductance of a particular sample can jump can jump um, by a, a factor of a hundred thousand. It can increase uh, enormously when it goes through the the superfluid transition. And heat spreads much 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 more more quickly. In fact, it's it's due to this um, very good transport of heat that this gave away 
superfluidity. You know, this was the hint to superfluidity that Camerlingonis saw when he he wrote in his his notebook where to write it. Something happens. Yeah, here he wrote something happens in his in his lab notebook, and the something happens that he saw was the a uh, very good transport of heat. So why is it that you can see um, very good transport of heat? Well, uh, typically when um, you know you're you're pumping on this on this fluid, lowering the pressure, lowering the pressure, and what uh, usually happens with a, a normal fluid is that you're doing this, the fluid boils and it's boiling off the top, and um, and it's it's rather it's rather a, a violent thing when something is boiling. You know, you've seen. Uh, pot boiling on the stove and you know the bubbles are coming up and they're, they're um, zipping off the top gas is coming off the top and it's it's very um, uh, agitated um, so let's think a second about why it is you get boiling well when you have boiling what you're getting is you're getting some very small region in your in your fluid which has gone above the um, the boiling point and it turns from liquid to gas so now you have a little bubble of gas in in your inside your your liquid and that gas then um, is at lower density and so it, it moves up and then comes off the top um, but once you get to this it's this super fluid where there's very very good transport of heat then the, the system comes to a completely uniform temperature it the heat is transported so efficiently that there is no little region of the sample which is which is at higher temperature than any other region of the sample. So you don't get these little regions which, are, which, which you know, locally go above the, uh, the boiling point and you don't nucleate little, uh, little bubbles inside the fluid. You still get evaporation. The evaporation comes entirely from the surface, but you don't uh, get bubbles forming in, in the bulk of the system. And you don't get these, these bubbles coming up um, in a very violent way. So if you ever watch um, uh, a cryogenic experiment um, as you're uh, you know, coming down this, this curve here and you're uh, cooling the, the helium down this, down this curve uh, from the um, you know, down towards the triple point um, from the liquefaction point, so walking down this curve it's extremely, extremely violent you get bubbling, 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 bubbling and then you hit the lambda point and you go through the lambda point and all of a sudden it's completely quiet there's no agitation whatsoever it's completely still and it becomes peaceful again and that's it's really impressive to watch it's it's really um a very noticeable effect and this is what cameron on saw uh in his experiment that he wrote down something happens he, he saw all of a sudden the bubbling stopped okay so this will explain this in a very good transport of heat um maybe in the, in the next lecture there's a third effect which gives uh, superfluidity its name um, which is the absence absence of viscosity of viscosity did I spell that right viscosity uh, viscosity no viscosity okay well okay however we spell it viscosity Whatever, whatever you know what I mean. It's viscosity. That that superfluids have a complete absence of viscosity if you measure it by flowing, uh, measured by by flow through a channel, through small channel. So, with typical fluids, you, you know, if you take a very very thin um, tube and you try to push the fluid through the tube, viscosity will give you a great big resistance to that fluid flow. You'll learn this in your fluid dynamics courses, um, but not so for superfluids. The superfluids go through tiny, um, tiny holes extremely, extremely readily. Um, and it was this effect that um, gives, actually, this, this was the first um, uh, time that the word superfluid was used. It was when this effect was first noticed. Now, we have a number of heroes of our story, um, besides Cameron Onis. Um, there'll be a number of other very important people, and one of them was the co-discoverer of this superfluidity effect, and this was a guy by the name of Peter Kapitza. Um, 
Peter, Peter, or I think Pyotr, Pyotr, like this in Russian, Kapitsa. So Kapitsa, eventually a Nobel laureate, he won his Nobel, Nobel Prize when he was quite old in 1978 for working in cryogenics. Um, um, but this work was, was known when he was much, much younger. So he was a, a superstar when he was, when he was a kid in, in Russia in uh, the early 1900s, um, superstar scientist. And rather appropriately for our current situation, um, he um, lost his, entire, his, his family to the uh, 1919 flu ec epidemic, his, his wife and both of his children, actually. Um, and he was um, uh, had finished, you know, he was, he was an, as an engineer at the time, but he wanted to become a, a real scientist. And he left Russia, uh, understandably, um, uh, try, try to start his life over. And he went to um, Cambridge, where he met Rutherford, who was running the, the Cambridge lab. Uh, Rutherford immediately realized this guy was was an amazing scientist, and he was a, a, a you know a professor and tri and um, fellow, well, professor, lecturer. Uh, a reader or whatever it was back then, uh, a fellow of Trinity College within within just a few years. Um, anyway, um, he set up one of the world's very best uh, cryogenic laboratories in Cambridge, and um, there was uh, quite a lot of competition to uh, to explore uh, cryogenics at that time. It was looking like a very uh, very exciting exciting topic. Um, anyway, in in 1934. Uh, Russia had become the Soviet Union, and he went back to to Russia just for a for a visit, and he um, this was a mistake um, because he was trapped there. Um, Stalin realized that this guy was a was a great scientist, and they wanted to have great scientists in the Soviet Union, and so he was more or less kidnapped and told that. You can keep being a great scientist, but you have to do it here in the Soviet Union, and we're not going to let you out. Um, so he made the best of, of the situation, decided, okay, I'm going to be a great scientist in the Soviet Union. They offered him a, an awful lot of, um, of resources to, to do this, and he managed to get some of his equipment sent from, from, uh, um, from Cambridge. Now, the other hero, the co-discoverer of uh, superfluidity was a guy by the name of John Allen, who at the time was, was much younger than, than Kapitza. He um, had done a, um, uh, a, a PhD in, in Toronto, and he had heard of the great Peter Kapitza, and he wanted to go to Cambridge to work with Kapitza and, uh, and work on, on, um, on helium and other low temperature uh, phenomena. Um, when he got there, Kapitza wasn't there because he was stuck in, in Russia and, he, and apparently wasn't coming back. Um, so um, what's he going to do? So he's this, this postdoc who doesn't know what he's, what he's, what he's going to be doing. But um, uh, the head of the lab, Rutherford, decided that, well, maybe this was, was an opportunity. And he turned the, the lab over to, to John Allen. And he said, well, okay, you're the head of the lab now. So you know, trial by fire, you can become the, the head of the lab and do, do your experiments on your own. And he saw it as an opportunity because, you know, Kapitza was being fairly famous, was, um, was making a, what was then seemed to be a ton of money, which was 800 pounds a year. I mean, that was, you know, that was a really good salary for, you know, for anyone at, at the time. And so Rutherford took his salary, he split it in half, actually. He gave half of it to uh, John Allen, and he took the other half of it and he hired a theorist by the name of Rudolf Pyrrhals, who I hope everyone, um, at least everyone in Oxford, knows of. Um, it was quite successful because John Allen did, did very well um, with his research in helium. Anyway, so at almost exactly the same time, Kapitza and, and John Allen had done almost exactly the same experiment, which was to try to uh, measure the viscosity of, of, um, of this, superflu this superfluid phase of helium. And they noticed that it um, the viscosity drops to zero, and when you try to when you try to measure by trying to push the helium through a a very thin channel, um, so this was um, one of the uh, amazing um, results. So so Kapitz is going to going to come back quite a few times in uh, in this in this story. Um, 
there's sort of a, a you know from the, the Oxford angle. Oxford was a little bit behind in the in the competition to to um, to explore superfluid helium. Actually, the Oxford had liquid helium before Cambridge did, but Cambridge beat Oxford to the punch in uh, figuring out that um, uh, um, that that helium had this interesting superfluid pro pro property. But you know, the, just just a, so it was 1938 when when the absence of viscosity was discovered by both of these labs. The next year, um, a really interesting effect was, was discovered in, in Oxford, um, which is known as super creep, um, which sounds like a, some evil Marvel villain. Um, and this super creep effect was discovered uh, here in Oxford by, by Francis uh, Simon and John Rollins. Um, and it's, it's a really, it's kind of another one of these rather spectacular uh, effects. If you have a um, a bucket, uh, okay, this is not a very good picture of a bucket. Let's draw a better better bucket. So start with the bottom, make it flat, okay, of 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 your superfluid helium. There it is. You fill it up with your fluid, maybe like this. Okay, it's filled up with fluid, um, and um, you just sit on the table in you know in a cold environment. So it's it's below the superfluid transition. What you discover is actually the the fluid will creep up over the side and out the bottom and onto the floor it will spontaneously siphon itself uh onto the floor which is a rather uh surprising um a rather surprising result but it's actually it's it's not so surprising once you realize that the um uh um once you realize that this this material has uh has zero viscosity and and the re the understanding of this is it's a combination of so-called wetting behavior equals wetting um, plus uh, no viscosity. No viscosity. Okay, did I at least misspell viscosity? Okay, I spell viscosity twice the same way, so it's either twice right or twice wrong. Um, so, what is wetting? Wetting is is the phenomenon that you know, when you when you have a surface. Very frequently, that surface will be uh, covered with just a, a few atomic layers of another material. Um, particularly, if so, if you take a a bucket of water or something like that, um, you know you can see where the level of the water is. But the sides of the bucket, much very far above the uh, the level of the water, um, might be actually covered with um, a few atoms of, of of water molecules because the water uh, is attracted to the edge. Of, of the of the container, and that's enough to hold it onto the uh, onto the edge of the container against gravity. So the the edge of the bucket will be will be fill will be will be coated with the fluid. So this is typical. Whenever something is near a fluid, it will attract a few of them of the of the molecules of the fluid, and it will stick to the edge of the of the container. It's just a few atoms, so it's not it usually doesn't do much. But the thing that's different here is that the helium with no viscosity can flow perfectly well through a channel which is only a few atoms thick. So you think of that, that layer of just a few atoms, a very, very thin layer here on the edge of the, of the, uh, of the bucket, just a few atoms thick. If it was water, there's no way water is going to flow through, uh, through a channel which is a few atoms thick, a few molecules thick, because water is viscous. And you know, trying to stick, you know, try to jam fluid through a, through a, a channel which is only a few atoms thick, it's going to be extremely resistive because of the viscosity. But with helium, there's no viscosity, even through very, very small channels. And so it flows with no problem through that, um, through that thin channel, and it sort of siphons itself out of the container and eventually onto the floor. So these are rather, rather remarkable um, effect known as creep or super creep, sometimes known as Rollins creep. Um, so it should have been, maybe I'll give the people credit, Rollins. And Simon, no relation, Simon. I don't think Oxford. Um, so John Allen is at Cambridge, and Kapisa is in USSR. Okay. Anyway, so so that's interesting that that the the helium has uh, no viscosity, but uh, if you measure the system differently, you get a different answer. So if you, if you do an experiment with a vibrating wire, which is a standard way 
to measure viscosity experiment. Um, so this is like a, a violin string. So you take a take a violin string and you pluck it, and the damping of those oscillations is uh, dependent on the viscosity of the fluid it's flowing in. In air, there's not a lot of damping, and it's probably damped more by the by the uh, by the place where you uh, you know friction at the edge endpoints. But if you take the violin string and you stick it in water and you pluck the uh, the violin string, it damps very quickly because it's pushing the uh, the water out of the way as it vibrates. So you're making uh, the decay of a, a vibration of, of a wire or a violin string tells you something about the uh, viscosity of the fluid. If you do the vibrating wire experiment in, um, in superfluid helium, in, in helium uh, for superfluid fluid, uh, I guess in helium 2, that's uh, Roman numeral 2 in the superfluid phase, um, you detect uh, non-zero viscosity. Viscosity, um, which uh, with uh, the viscosity going to zero at t equals zero. So that's kind of puzzling. So if you're trying to flow it through a channel, you get zero viscosity. But if you're um, by, you know, measuring it with a vibrating wire, you get finite viscosity. It's very strange, and um, this is something we're going to try to explain in the next lecture. So this seems to be a good place to, to stop the lecture, and we'll pick up again uh, next time.